we're, we're kind of in the desert for Cowboys stuff right now, Chop. Yeah, it's the uh, it's the wasteland right now. You, it's a little too far from the draft to really feel like, oh, let's let's deep dive into it. Uh, we were about a month removed from the Cowboys season ending, so there's not like storylines that came out of that that we haven't talked about. So this is like pretty much the deadest period of the off season for yeah. the Cowboys. Because then you'll get into mini camp, OTAs. We'll have lots of stuff to talk about from there after the draft. But thank you to Jory Epstein, who sat on a story, it looks like, for about a week. <laughs> she uh, she got this at Super Bowl last week and brought it out, uh, brought, wrote an article about it yesterday. And it's a, a really good article. I'll tweet it uh, when we're done with this segment. How much will Cowboys offense change under Mike McCarthy? Dak Prescott weighs in. And this is something that we've all been talking about here is, okay, what is this going to look like? Is this going to be, you know, uh, is is what we saw from Mike McCarthy, the results that he got in Green Bay, is that indicative of what can happen here in Dallas? Or was it more indicative of Aaron Rodgers and what Aaron Rodgers can do? And, and you know, I know you're generally in favor, right, of the quarterback matters infinitely more than the play caller. Oh, Absolutely. And of course he does. He plays the game, but you think the the play caller has very little impact on how successful. No, the I mean is. I think I think it, I think it helps. Obviously, I mean you you call the wrong play against the wrong coverage, but the thing is, is like, you know, when Kellen Moore called to play, he had no idea what look the defense was going to give him. Who's more important? Would you rather have a great play caller or a great running back? Great play caller. Wow, that's that's strong. Well, we'll see if Mike McCarthy can be that. The question we all have now is how much it's going to change. Is it going to look different even? Are we going to notice a difference? Um, because I think we noticed a difference early on when Kellen took over from Scott Linehan. Because that was the question. Is there even going to be a difference? And then Kellen took over and it was different. I think it became more conservative over the course of the last two years or so. But Kellen was also, I think, trying to create a hybrid system of Eric Coriel and, mm -hmm. you know, some of the Scott Linehan and, and Jason Garrett both came from those sort of concepts. A lot of people consider Scott Linehan's like the godfather of the single back offense. So it was like a hybrid of that stuff. You know, the, the Linehan Garrett stuff, the Eric Coriel stuff. Um, and then the, the McCarthy West coast offense aspects that he wanted merged in. So he really created this bizarre hybrid. And I think that I think Kellen Moore caught too much flack here. I think that it may be the greatest reason for some of the confusing stuff when Kurt Warner or other analysts would talk about turning on and going, I don't even understand the system. It's because I don't think it was a, a normal system. It was just a hodgepodge of, okay, they want this. They want, all right, we're making, uh, what is it? Gumbo. Is gumbo one of those ones where you, I don't eat gumbo. Is that one of those ones where you just throw stuff in? Or? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things in gumbo, but is it like, uh, take some of the, like, whatever. It's like, you're making, uh, I, mean, I, I think everybody like, it's, has their own recipe. It's, it's like when you, you have Shrimp, Thanksgiving sausage all on rice, like dirty rice it's, and it, stuff. It's veggies. like, it's like when you have a uh, Thanksgiving dinner and then you make like turkey soup, like, well, I got the oh, stock yeah. and I'll put some stuff in here. Like that's what the offense essentially did. Why does everybody, when they talk about, you know, food, they always do the thing with the, cause it's salt bay, baby. Salt. It's Ooh, it's salt bay. Oh, you know, you just mix it all in. He's a cultural like I didn't do that. I did I do this? No, but you did the stir. Oh yeah, I did stir. Yeah. That was literally because we're talking about well, soup. How, how do you pour salt? Do you go like this? Do I go like what? Like? Can you show me again? <laughs> well, I mean, like you know, you. No, you I use really... a salt grinder. Uh, okay, that's what I use. You, you, you do the, the pepper grinder method. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm on the grinder a lot. Uh, Dax said uh, when asked about how much he expects. The offense to change said right now mike told me about 20 to 30 percent change i think if anything it's things that need to be changed it's great to dial in fix some things get sharper and crisper and i'm excited and as he uh went down a little bit he said sometimes change is good i'm a big believer in change and i'm excited for mike calling the plays i'm excited for shoddy brian schottenheimer i'm excited for just being able to dial into this offense and just really get it to where we want it to be i'm excited as hell is that just Dak speak? I mean, no. I mean, he probably is excited. Could he be, though? Why not? I mean, uh, Kellen, he's a positive Kellen, guy in general. Kellen was a friend of his. Well, I mean, you could you could you could recognize Kellen as a friend of yours and be excited for you know um, any kind of change. I I think Kellen's got a Kellen landed on his feet in arguably a better position. He did. Yeah, I, I I think that's on. I mean, he's question. got a, he's got a better quarterback now. As good as good as Dak is, Justin Herbert's got more talent. I think that 
Uh, let's be completely honest here. Change is, is difficult for everyone, right? So Dak has been with Kellen for a very long time. When the change occurred in 2020 and Mike McCarthy got here, that was not the smoothest personality transition, I don't think, for your quarterback. I think that there was some initial, like, feeling each other out and trying to, you know, get used to a new head coach. And I think they have. I think they're really good now. Um, I don't know that Kellen and McCarthy ever got on the same page like that. It's okay. And so, but that's what I'm saying is that I think that there's, there's, I would think there would maybe be a little, I don't know how excited he would be more as just like, I think Dak is excited that they maybe just are no longer running a hybrid. Like, hey, can we either run what Kellen wants to run completely or can we run what Mike wants to run completely? I maybe believe, I'll, I'll believe that. But in general, he's a guy who, he trusts his arm and he trusts himself to make big plays. And if this is going to turn into the Brian Schottenheimer Seahawks offense, God no. it's going to be a very, or, or even what McCarthy is talking about doing with the run game, it's going to be a very run-focused offense and a bunch of short to intermediate throws that are not going to allow him to push the ball downfield. And that's... It's 2023, not 1993. I don't want to go back. If they if they do a it, it, let's just say they do a run first offense, you know that's probably going to slow the game down, and they may win more games. You know that 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 might happen. It's probably going to slow the game down. Um, they're probably going to score fewer points, and again, they, they may want to win more games. We don't know, but it's going to look really really odd and really bad when the Cowboys sit here scoring 23 a game and the Chargers are at 29. Yeah, now who's gonna who's that gonna reflect on more, Dak or McCarthy? I bet I bet if they do that next year, people are blaming Dak more than McCarthy. People I blame. I mean, they'll blame both of them, but people sure. blame Dak because people like to blame Dak. They'll want to get rid of both of them though. But they'll say, what Let's they'll get rid say of is, oh man, see, you know, shouldn't have gotten rid of Kellen Moore. I mean, when Kellen when it was Kellen's concepts in 2019, the one year where Kellen was running, the offense looked great in the first part of the season. It he he didn't adjust well in the second half. The, the biggest problem with Kellen. That was Jason's last year. Uh huh. That was the year where they started out three and zero. They cooked the Giants like thirty five to ten on opening day. Um, the biggest problem with Kellen, people tell you, is he didn't adjust. Like he wouldn't adjust as the season wore on when teams started trying to figure out different ways to attack them. And the other issue was he needed space, like to create concepts. So when you got in the red zone and the field tightened he had trouble. Like, he had trouble, like, drawing up creative stuff in shorter areas. And so, like, you know, when we all marveled at how Kansas City was drawing things up inside the 10, like, wow, look at these concepts they did to get five, six yards of separation in such a small area. Like, that was a criticism that I think a lot of people had about Kellen Moore is that he wasn't doing much of that at all. And you would hope that some of that would improve here. Now, one of the aspects that could potentially signal improvement, depending on your thoughts on it, does Cavante Turpin do anything for you, Chop? Is that going to be a big game changer for you? No. Are you sure? I'm, I'm sure. Is this a TCU hate thing? No. For you? I don't hate TCU. No. Oh. Cavante Turpin was talking with Blogging the Boys last week. He said, uh, we had a talk during my exit meeting, him and the coaching staff, basically saying like they already know what I did with the special teams this year and all that, but they're going to try and get me on the offense and try to make our guys respect me more on both sides of the ball. I'm going into this training camp. I'm basically trying to show them that they have no choice but to use me on offense. That's my mindset. I like the mindset. Um, he says, I'm a playmaker with the ball in my hands, and I can scare guys without the ball. Just on the same field together, me and CeeDee Lamb, I just feel like that's my biggest thing going on, just showing them that they got to have me on the field. I will say this. I don't think Cavante Turpin needs to be any sort of a full-time player. Now, I know a lot of people, a lot of fans. We saw it on the fan text. We've seen it on the Twitch and everywhere else. Um... A lot of people have asked, like, why is Cavante Turpin not getting mm -hmm. more of an opportunity? He's fast and, like, yeah. let him go out there and use the speed. Guys, he is 5'7", maybe. Like, he's – and it's really tough, even with that speed, it's tough to push the ball downfield to a guy that small. It's just – it's it's difficult to, to get it over the top of DBs. And so, generally, teams don't like having 5'7 receivers run vertically like that, even if they have the speed to do it. Where I, I had said this whole time, anytime they kneeled down in the second half or at the end of the first half was a stupid play. Every single time, just give the ball to Cavante Turpin. Have him in the backfield, toss it once, let him see if he can do something. 
Like that to me, I always thought it was a waste whenever they'd kneel down. Get the ball in Kevontae Turpin's hands. If it's a screen, if yeah. it's a pitch, just see if he can pick up 50 yards for you. I can see you. that. And so, I mean, you remember Tyree Kill when Kansas City came to town about five oh years God. ago. They did that one at yes. the end. Of Do that. Just throw a screen pass and see if he can work. See if he can pick up play like a big chunk of yards where it's like, well, okay, well, now we'll call a timeout because we're getting close to field goal range or see if he can score. Do something like that. I'm all in favor of using him on things that aren't even gadget plays. You can use him in the short, you know, the short areas, the intermediate areas. But if if he wants to be in 80% of the snaps, like I'm in the full receiver rotation, I'm I'm running the full route tree, that's not going to happen. And that's not the no, same. No, he's thing. not. That's not what he does. No. He's he's got no size. I, I have no idea what kind of routes he runs. People are saying the fan text, he's Forrest Gump. <laughs> yeah, you catch the kickoff and then run it over to Forrest. Yeah. And run, Forrest! Turpin, I mean, look... Tur Turpin, I think, would you? This is interesting. Would you say he was a disappointment? I wouldn't, but there were a lot of people who were disappointed in the second half the way he played, and the fact that he didn't get a single touchdown. I know a lot of people were disappointed in the uh, the San Francisco game. You remember we talked about that, the kickoff return where he spun it back into the kicker for some reason. Yeah. Like, I mean, were there? Did you think he was ultimately more? Did you did you ultimately find him to be disappointing? No. You think, yeah. No. I how, didn't, but there were people there were people who were. Oh, how was he disappointing? Because he didn't uh, like the kickoffs uh, the kickoff return the return game was getting consistently worse in the second half of the season. He wasn't giving you the type of I mean, he wasn't in the NFL. There was a reason this guy wasn't in the NFL. Well, he wasn't in the NFL cuz he got in trouble for a domestic issue yeah. at TCU. But still, he wasn't in the NFL. Yes. Um like they they he's a he's fine. He's okay. Bobby's he's just mad because he lost the bet to Jared. That made me mad. What was the bet again? That he would score a touchdown sometime in the first six weeks. And then Jared was like, double or nothing. He doesn't do it by the end of the season. I was like, okay. And then he didn't do it. Like, we were, there were a couple different times we were really holding our breaths. And Jared was like, oh, you almost got me. Shut up, Jared. We'll talk to Jared at 840, by the way. Uh, but look, I think the one thing, uh, whether it's Turpin, and it, it wouldn't be Turpin, but Turpin or somebody else, the clear thing to me, the number one priority heading into this offseason is you have to go get, for the love of God, a number two receiver. A legitimate guy who can get open, and even if he's not open, can just make contested catches that isn't Michael Gallup. Michael Gallup's fine to have in the rotation. Michael Gallup can't be the number two. And if, if you want to go get Luke Musgrave in the draft, if you want to go find some elite tight end, do something like that, great. A, a tight end is a, a really great mismatch, can be a, an effective number two. I'll take that. I'll take a, a really athletic tight end who can mismatch but you have got to get a second receiver in here and I don't want to hear anybody say the whole little why does Dak have to be straight just get a number two quit arguing about why does Dak have to do this or that because it doesn't fit your narrative just go ahead and say get a number two get get another weapon in here why do you not want weapons to me I think that's the easiest call for what they need heading into the offseason is another big play threat in the receiving game they do need another big play threat there's no doubt I don't think he's it though no not Damn Turpin. No. Not they, but they Gallup. do they do need uh they do need a big big play threat. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Gallup is that guy, but he's got to get his mind right. Yes. That that's the that'll be one of the things to watch this offseason. What kind of mindset does he come to the training camp with?